personal evangelism. Yes, sir. That was a bunch of church of Christers. Who was the guy that grew the long hair on his face? Crying. Richard Crane. 598. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, stand. righteous father in heaven father we come before thy throne this morning thanking thee for the night of rest that we've had also thanking thee for the privilege that we've had this week to meet here to hear these lessons from thy word father to build us up in the faith father to arm us to be able to go out into the world and, Father, to be able to teach thy message to those round about us. The Father, that in doing so, that many souls might be brought unto thee. Father, we thank thee for the Memphis School of Preaching. Father, for what it means to us within our life. Father, for the education that we received here. And, Father, for the encouragement that we receive be able to stand for thee in times that seems hard. Father, we ask thee that you would be with those who are sick and in need of our prayers, to be with Brother Kirby and Brother Rutherford, and Father, all those others that have been mentioned from time unto time, and Father, we might always come unto thee, seeking thy help seeking thy love, and seeking thy comfort. Father, we ask thee to be with the speaker of this hour, the Father, that as he proclaims thy message unto us, the Father, that it might fall into our hearts, and Father, may we live it in our life, and Father, share it with others. Father, we thank thee so much for this week. And, Father, we ask that you'd continue to be with us within our lives. Father, continue to strengthen each one of us. Father, we ask that you would be with those who are traveling and those who will be traveling, that they might have a safe passage to their home. Father, we ask thee to forgive us when we sin. Father, we thank thee so much for thy son, his willingness to come to this earth. Father, to die upon that cross, to shed his blood, that through that great sacrifice that we have the opportunity 
to be able to be called thy children. And Father, may we so live that we can all be in heaven together. In thy son's name we pray, and amen. amen. Our speaker is the local evangelist for the church in Coldwater, Mississippi. And Clifton's biggest problem in life is that one of the elders there is Billy Bland. Clifton's in his fourth year of preaching, fifth year actually, and he's been overseas already into Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines, and Brother Angel, I think, probably hanging around Billy, you'll have to go some more, so he goes a lot. Clifton is a graduate engineer from the University of Georgia. He received his bachelor's degree in engineering in 2008, and immediately began at the Memphis School of Preaching in January 2009. He's working right now toward a master minister degree with the Fried Hardeman University program. And that will be completed this May, and that is a wonderful effort on his part. Clifton is a most unusual individual in that the year he came to school as an angel, Jesus came with him too. And so I thought that was interesting that that very year we had an angel and Jesus on campus. We got some Spanish folks whose first name is Jesus. Clifton's going to talk to us about a man who saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and then a little later asked the Lord to receive his spirit, to receive Stephen's spirit. And so we asked Stephen, or uh, Clifton to talk this morning about still standing like Stephen, Brother Clifton Angel. We also had a lamb in our class during that year. We did, yes, sir. I want to first begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to uh, Brother Mosier, to each one of the faculty members that have that labor with the school and that uh, make this lectureship possible, make the program that, that uh, happens at the school and continues uh, to happen, uh, to make those things possible for the eldership here, for each member of this congregation and, and congregations throughout the world who make uh, this education that is received here uh, for preaching and for the preacher's wives. Uh, possible to make this possible uh, for that I'm so uh, grateful also wanted to commend those uh, that have made it possible uh, have been working diligently to uh, get the live stream updated that's been going on this year I know that uh, personally it has benefited me when I've not been able to to be here in person and I know that it also makes it possible for uh, family and friends back home in Georgia that uh, want to be able to see uh, some of these and maybe even me uh, but uh, certainly good to be here and I'm thankful for the opportunity and all the work that has gone on into this lectureship and into the school that is here the church was growing they were rejoicing in their newfound faith and fellowship they were spending a lot of time together uh, they were witnessing a lot of things happen before their eyes. They had witnessed thousands of baptisms occurring. They had witnessed miracles being uh, performed and wonders and signs being worked just before their eyes. Their leaders, the apostles that, that were in front of them, also had been apprehended. They had been imprisoned. They had been rebuked, and they had been beaten. And they saw all of this unfold. And the church was growing. The church was growing and those that had an abundance of things were giving to those that lacked. They were sharing with one another and as the, the Bible terms it, they had all things common. Until one day, uh, there arose a, mur a murmuring. There arose a murmuring, a complaint. Acts 6 and verse 1 is where I am at this time. 
Thankfully, that was the last time that a complaint ever happened in the church, right? No. But there was a great complaint that arose in the church in that day. In Jerusalem we are, is, is the place that we are. And we go to the text here and we see that this complaint was by the Grecians, the Hellenistic Jews, and it was against the Hebrews, those Jews that would have been uh, local to Palestine because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So as they spent time together and as those that were, had abundance gave to those that lacked, somewhere along the way, the Grecian widows were neglected. We're not told specifically why this might be. Maybe it was because of prejudice. Maybe it was a, a simple overlook. We don't know. But there was a great complaint, a murmuring that was brought about by the Hellenistic Jews, the Grecians, against the Hebrews because their widows uh, were neglected in, in the daily ministration, the daily giving uh, to one another. So the twelve... They called the church together. They called the multitude of the disciples together. So we've got Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas the brother of James, and Matthias calling together the church to discuss this matter. Apparently it was a great enough matter that the apostles were addressing it. That They were saying that this something needs to be done about this. These Grecian widows need to be taken care of, but they note here that it was not their place to do it in, on this occasion. The twelve called the multitude of the disciples to, uh, unto them, verse 2, and said, It is not reason or it is not fitting that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. He's the first one of the seven that is listed to, uh, that is given to us. We're introduced to this man, Stephen. And the first thing that we're told about him is that he was a man. I want us to think about that for a moment. Stephen was a man. It is a temptation for each one of us, I am sure. I know it is a temptation of mine to sometimes look at those that we read about in the Bible as superheroes, to look at them as extraordinary, to look at them as something to which I could never attain, to look at them as something so special that because I, can, I feel like I cannot attain to that level of service, to that level of servitude, then I uh, excuse myself from doing what they have done. Maybe we look at the Apostle Paul and we say, well, that was Paul, but I don't have to do that. Well, th that was Jesus, but I don't have to live like him. Certainly, I wouldn't be expected to live uh, like him. And we've got to be careful that we realize that each one of these were men. Stephen was a man. That means he had weaknesses like I do. That means he probably had guilt like I do. He may have sinned in ways that I have and that each one of us have. Stephen was a man. And let's, let's be careful to make sure that we look at the Bible examples that we have of men and women as they are, they're examples to us. We can truly live like them and use and exemplify uh, and live our lives in ways that they have lived theirs. Stephen was a man, but we can see also that he was a man that was a disciple. He was a follower of Christ. He didn't just sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. He actually followed Jesus. And we could see it in his life. We can see that he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom in verse 3. In verse 5, we're told that he was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, we are told that he was full of faith and power. What does it mean that he was full of the Holy Spirit? He had the revelation of the Holy Spirit within him. Yes, certainly he was revealed some things directly by the Holy Spirit, and he was enabled in ways that we are not in order to confirm the message that he had, that it was from the Holy Spirit, that it was from God. 
But he was full of the Holy Spirit in that he was full of the revelation, the words that were revealed by the Holy Spirit. He was full of the faith that they were preaching, the faith that is in Jesus Christ, in the fact that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, being a perfect man and was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and that he brought a new covenant and that he established a church of which he was a part. That's who St Stephen was. He was a disciple, a follower. But also, Stephen was a deacon. Now, there are some that will say, I know 100% or I believe 100% that Stephen was a deacon as those deacons are laid out in, for us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications there that are given for us. That I, of that, I'm not sure. And I'm not dogmatic about that. And then there are others that will say, well, Stephen was not a deacon like those that are given qualifications for in 1 Timothy 3. Of that, I'm not sure. We're not given revelation. We're not told uh, all the specifics surrounding Stephen's life as to whether he fit those qualifications or not. We are told that he did serve in a specific capacity. He was chosen for an official position, if you will, or an official work to serve these Grecian widows to make sure that the Grecian widows were taken care of. We know that he did other things as well, like preaching, as we will see in a moment. But this thing about, about Stephen being a deacon, I want us to notice the word, the root word of, for deacon, the word from which deacon comes, is found, uh, first of all, in verse 1. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily deaconing, deaconship, in the daily ministration, when they were serving, when they were giving. Well, that's what a deacon is to do. That's the literal meaning of, of his title. Certainly, there in 1 Timothy 3, we are given official positions of these titles of, of men who serve in specific capacities. And certainly, these men, like Stephen, were serving in specific capacities. But there are others that are deacons in the sense of the general uh, definition of the word. Because they're all of the, uh, the church was involved in this daily ministration. We see the word again in verse 2. The twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not fitting that we should leave the word of God and deacon tables, serve tables. That's the word there. In verse 3, uh, no, excuse me, verse 4, but we, all, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the deaconing of the word, ministry. So deacon, it, it means to serve. It means uh, to be a servant, to be a minister. And so we see here that uh, those that were any of the church were to be serving as deacons in that capacity. Any of uh, the, the apostles were also serving in that capacity, if you will. So each one of us in the general sense of the word are deacons. Now, we're, we don't all fit the qualifications that are listed for us in 1 Timothy 3. So we don't all have that title, if you will, but each one of us are to be servants, to be ministers to others as the church belonging to our Lord. In that sense, I will be dogmatic that Stephen was a deacon, that he was a servant, and we see that. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of wisdom. He was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. He was full of faith and power, and he did great works of wonders before those, and he preached, as we see. Stephen was a man who was a disciple, and he was a deacon. Before we move on to our next point, I want us to consider some things, ask some, ourselves some questions just for consideration and to help Stephen become more real to us in that he was a man. If he were a deacon, in the sense that we have deacons of First Timothy 3, he had to have had a wife, and he would have had to had, have had children. When you think about Stephen and what he's about to do, according to the text, and what he has done, you ever think about the possibility of him having a wife and what it meant that he left behind when he gave his life. Have you ever thought about what it, what it might mean if he had children? What about his parents 
Who were they? His father and mother, were they still living? We don't know. Were, were they uh, devout Jews at this time or, or had they converted to Christ? We don't know. What about his friends and his family? Stephen was a man. He was real. And we can relate to that. Stephen was a man who also had a message. He had a message. And with this message, he disputed and he defended. We can see that he disputed in Acts 6, again, beginning at verse 6. After they've chosen these seven, whom the seven they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. So the truth is being resisted. And that's nothing new, is it, to those who will follow God and will uphold the truth? The truth has been preached, it has been confirmed, and now it is being resisted by those that do, want, do not want to accept it. Those of these various synagogues are listed here that are disputing with Stephen. We're not told if they are all gathered into one place and Stephen is disputing with each one of them from the synagogues or if Stephen is actually going around preaching to these various synagogues. But we are, uh, Brother Wayne Jackson tells us that this word disputing gives the idea of ongoing combat. He is continuously defending, disputing his cause and debating with them the cause of Christ. The, Brother Wayne Jackson says the fact that Stephen was disputing with these antagonists demonstrates that Christianity is not merely passive, it engages the enemy. Not like Islamic violence. No, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6, 12. We are in a spiritual warfare. We are in a spiritual battle. And that's the way that we must engage the enemy, with boldness, disputing for the cause of Christ. So he disputed. And they were not able to resist, verse 10, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. From whence did Stephen get his message? What was the message that he was using to debate with others? Was it something that he had developed on his own? Was it something that he had concocted by his own uh, wisdom that he had? No. It was by revelation of the Holy Spirit. I've been studying this week some about the Holy Spirit in preparation for a future sermon. And in that study and reading, I was reminded about the Holy Spirit's work in creation and how that Job tells us in Job 26 and 13 that the Holy Spirit garnished the heavens, beautified the heavens. And it, you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 and we're told that the earth was without form and void and the Spirit moved upon the waters. So the Spirit was active in making that which was form and void beautiful. Beautiful. Brother Eric Owens takes that and he says also the Spirit has garnished the, the plan of redemption, the scheme of redemption. He has been active and, and made uh, the, the plan of redemption beautiful. And I got to thinking about that. You know, if the Spirit would not have done what he did in the work of the church, in the establishment of the church, in the going forth of the Word of God and the, all the letters that were written, where would we be as the church? we would be without form and void. If we didn't have the letter to the church at Corinth, if we didn't have the, the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of these revealed by the Holy Spirit, and that's what he did to make the church perfect and complete and built up and beautiful. But without his teachings, we would be without form and void. Likewise, let's apply that individually. If we're not taking in the Spirit's teachings into our lives 
studying his word, reading his word, ingesting his word, and filling our minds with what the spirit teaches us and not what uh, some other, uh, other people come up with in their minds. If we don't fill our minds with his teachings, we're going to be without form and void, spiritually speaking. But Stephen used the words of the Holy Spirit to dispute. Therefore, in verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And so they suborned men. Suborn. The idea is that they went and secretly got some men and they may have even told them what to say. A.T. Robertson indicates that they may have even given them money to say what they needed to say against Stephen. So they went and suborned men. Are these, are these people honest? If they really have something to get Stephen, to bring against Stephen, and they have to suborn men, are they honest in what they're doing? Absolutely not. So they suborn men, we're told, and which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Some have indicated that uh, they placed Moses and God on the same level. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and called him and brought him to the council and set, him up, set up false witnesses. Once again, are they honest? If they have to set up witnesses to tell false things about Stephen, they set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth, ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. So they have charged Stephen with speaking against Moses. They have charged Stephen with speaking against God. They have charged Stephen with speaking blasphemy. They have charged Stephen with speaking against the temple and speaking against their law. Oh, they are enraged and they're ready to get rid of this man because they don't want to get rid of Moses. And they don't want to get rid of the God they serve, which is not the God of the Bible, obviously, because of their not listening to what the Holy Spirit teaches. They didn't want to get rid of their law and their temple. And so they've got to get rid of Stephen because he was showing them that those things were no longer of greatest importance. So they bring him before the high priest. In verse 14, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Have you ever wondered what that looked like? I'm joking. But his face was as a face of an angel. And so they bring him before the high priest, and the high priest asks him, Are these things so? According to Deuteronomy 17, 2 through 7, they're supposed to bring him and give him an opportunity to give his defense before they stone him for the accusations that they have made against him. How sad is it that they pick and choose what they want from the law? It reminds me so much of the trial of our Lord and how they, they wanted, they were trying to follow the law in certain aspects, but yet they were so dishonest and liars and, and just corrupt men in all, in all the occasion that was happening. And yet they were trying to still stick by the law. They wanted to take down his body before the Sabbath. And, and all of these kinds of things. Well, this, they bring him to the high priest to give him an opportunity to defend himself. And so the high priest gives him this occasion. He says, are these things so? And it's then that Stephen defends with his message. Who does Stephen defend? Yes, he, he defends himself against these accusations, but is he really trying to defend himself? Or is he defending the actual message that he has given? It is then that we can read from verses 2 all the way through verse 50, this long discourse of the history of God's uh, working with uh, his people. And we see in Acts 7, 2 through 50, uh, F.F. F. Bruce says that his account of Moses' early days, the call of Moses in the wilderness wanderings, provided an indirect answer to the charge of speaking against Moses and a more direct answer to the charge of speaking against God. And his contrast between the wilderness tent and the uh, Jerusalem temple implies uh, particularly to the charge of speaking against the temple. H. Leo Bowles described his, his message this way, that God did not confine himself to uh, the Holy Land, 
nor to the temple. He appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia, to Joseph in, and Israel in Egypt, to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. Hence, God's glorious appearings to their father were outside the land of Canaan and before the temple was in existence. And so he was answering their accusations that they had against him, particularly pertaining to this place, if you will, the temple and, and Jerusalem and them wanting to hold on to it as their holy place. And so Stephen showed them how that God had dealings with his, his people before those things and outside of those things even existed. And now he has gone beyond it, even now in the new covenant. And so he defended. Because, and this defense led to his martyr. The third place, where we, we notice that Stephen is a man who had a message. We notice his message was from the Holy Spirit. And with that message, he disputed and he defended and now we, we notice that he was martyred. It means that he gave up his life for a cause which he deemed greater than himself. And this particular, particular martyrdom was for Jesus Christ, the greatest martyrdom that there could be. He did not try to uh, protect his life once they uh, came after him. But he said in verse 51, after, saying, after preaching the things he did about the history of God's people and God's relationship with them, in verse 51 he said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. You see, he was martyred because of their denial of the Holy Spirit's teachings. He said, You do always resist the Holy Spirit, even as your, your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the lust, uh, excuse me, the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it. Well, they're certainly not going to take that. You're saying that we're, we're not keeping the law? And yet their, their whole, all of their accusations against him were pertaining to the law. Stephen was right. They weren't keeping the law because the law told them about Jesus and led them to Jesus. And he was trying to show them who Jesus was. And he says that those things of old were about the just one, Jesus. But they have always resisted the Holy Spirit. Because of their denial of the Holy Spirit, he was martyred. But he was also martyred in order to display the testimony of Jesus Christ. In verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Can you see the movie cameras panning from the feet of Saul where their, their clothing's being laid up to his face and we're introduced to Saul? What great irony that's seen in this passage where Stephen is being stoned and there Saul, the one who would eventually write the majority of the New Testament that we have today, is there at his death. Stephen was martyred. And Paul knew that. Later he said to Jesus, Acts 22 and 20, when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Do you think that ever plagued Paul? As, do you think his past ever plagued him? The fact that he was there consenting unto the death of Stephen and now he realizes that Stephen was doing that which was right. He was defending the right cause and he was killed in vain. Stephen was martyred. Because he was a man who had a message that was martyred, I want to know what his motivations are. Stephen, what, what is your motivation to give your life in such a way? What was the motivation that was dr driving Stephen? May I submit to you that he was focused 
on a crown. It's interesting to me that the name Stephen comes from the word that it is translated for us, crown, in other places. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 2, we find this word crown. We know that we're thinking about a crown in heaven, the incorruptible crown at least. Stephen gave up this corruptible crown for an incorruptible crown. He gave up Stephen for the incorruptible Stephanos crown. That's what was driving Stephen. He was not laying up his treasures on earth, but laying them up in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. In Matthew 6, he was not conformed to this world, but he had transformed his life by the renewing of his mind, by the teachings of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 12 and 2, he was focused on a greater crown. But you know, there, the motivations... For Stephen, we can also see motivations descending from Stephen. What happened after Stephen's death? Notice with me in verse 60, he kneeled down, Stephen that is, and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, there they that were scattered abroad were scared to death and never preached the word again. No. They went everywhere preaching the word. What if today someone in our midst is murdered because of their faith, is put in prison because of their faith in Christ, is, is mis, mistreated because of their faith in Christ like Stephen was? How will we react? Will we react in such uh, fear that, that we will sh shun the Word of God, that we will no longer preach the Word of God for fear of our own lives? Or will we react in the same way that the church did then and go everywhere preaching the word? That's the motivations that were descended from Stephen. Stephen was a man. Uh, let's remember that. And let, let's take his life as an example to ours. Uh, he was a man with a message. And because of his message, which it came from the Holy Spirit, we have the same message from the Holy Spirit. Then he was martyred. He, was, he died because of it. But his motivation was that he was focused on a far greater crown. You know, we can't be Stephen, but we can stand like Stephen. I'm going to have to invite him back. He, got, he quit just as soon as I got up here. And I didn't want him to quit. I was just knowing the time was running out. A man with a message who was martyred. What was his motivation? Well, I guess there are some books left over there if you don't have one. I know that Tucker told me most of them are gone, and that's a good thing. There are CDs and DVDs that your friends may want to view over the years. We are on msop.org and oabs.org and what other .orgs, Brother Bland? Lots of .orgs out there. I'll never forget how illiterate I was when computers first started. And on the lecture here one year, I said, how far does all of this message reach? And somebody said, it's www, Brother Mosier, World Wide Web. Oh, I didn't know what the www meant. But I'm getting to learn it, and I hope you'll use that, those tools. Clifton, thank you so much. And I'm so grateful that now I know what an angelic face looks like. <laughs> you may be dismissed until the next session. <laughs>